Hello, everybody. Um, I am really excited to be here with everybody today, both in person um, at the K Center, which I'll tell you a little bit more about in a second, and then also um, with all of our friends here on Zoom tonight. So um, for my friends on Zoom, can you guys just give me a thumbs up that you can hear me okay? We doing okay? Anyone got a thumbs up or unmute yourself? Yeah. Trisha? Okay, awesome. Thank you. I appreciate it. All right. So let's go ahead and get started in earnest. Okay. Welcome, everyone. My name is Jess Posner. My pronouns are she and they, and I am the director of the Virtual Y at the YMCA of Central New York. I am a white woman in her mid-30s with brown asymmetrical hair, glasses, and a face mask covering the bottom half of my face. The background behind me is the K Center, located in our Northwest Family YMCA in Baldwinsville, New York. I am honored to welcome you to today's virtual seminar, Cancer Survivorship with Trisha Evely, Nurse Practitioner from Hematology Oncology Associates of CNY, also known as HOA. Today is a special hybrid virtual event with friends joining us both via Zoom and here in person at the K Center. You can see them in the room with the purple wall. So friends, if you wanna wave at our friend, there you go, awesome. <laughs> um, we are honored to offer tonight's event as part of a variety of in-person and virtual resources to support those impacted by breast cancer. Here at the Y, we strive to support all of our members in body, mind, and spirit at all stages of life and recovery. We hope these resources will be supportive to survivors, those who care for them, and all people looking to learn more about breast cancer. To learn more about this, you can visit ymcacny.org slash bcam2022. Before I introduce our guest, I'd like to do a little housekeeping. I'd like to take a few moments to just orient us to our virtual meeting platform, which is Zoom for our friends joining us that way. Please do keep your audio muted for the entire program unless you are invited to unmute. If you would like to communicate with me or ask me questions, please use the chat function, which you can access on the bottom screen if you are joining in a computer or in the three dots if you are joining via mobile or tablet. Following the presentation, there will be time for a question and answer, so please do share those questions with us in the chat. For those of us in the room, we'll do it a little bit differently where you can just kind of raise your hand and I'll turn the microphone around and try to capture you that way, and then I can repeat things if folks don't hear it online, okay? Um, we have enabled live transcription for the event. From a computer, you can turn this on by clicking live transcript, which is the CC icon in the menu at the bottom of your screen and selecting show subtitle. From a mobile or tablet, you can access these settings by clicking the three dots. Finally, you will notice that tonight's event is being recorded. Only the speaker's video feeds will be included in any publicly shared version of this event. I also wanted to let you all know, both on Zoom and in the room, that it is possible that we may encounter a little bit of feedback or echo with our audio tonight as we transition between speakers and microphones in the room. For those in the room, uh, for those not in the room, I have like two computers, three monitors, a couple sets of speakers on all those things and a microphone, and there can be a little bit of feedback when those things um, all exist together in the same room. So I'm gonna do my best to minimize that with patience um, and a slow transition between between our different speakers. Um, but I did just wanna let you know that um, I am deeply uh, grateful for your patience and good humor as we collaborate with the technology that allows us to be in this moment together. Finally, I just wanna thank everyone in your generosity and creating beautiful community space of listening and learning this evening. Um, so thank you to those of you in the room and thank you to everybody in the virtual room as well. So without further ado, I wanna invite our guest, Trisha Evely, to come off of her um, muted camera. I'm gonna spotlight her and I would like to introduce her. Trisha Evely is a nationally certified nurse practitioner at Hematology Oncology Associates of Central New York. She obtained her bachelor's degree of nursing from Indiana University of Pennsylvania and earned her master's degree in family practice nurse and nursing from the State University of New York Medical University. Trisha has been a nurse practitioner for 16 years and supports patients through her specialties in survivorship, wellness, communication and smoking sensation. She is coming to us from Hematology Oncology Associates of CNY, a private community cancer center established um, 
and current established 40 years ago um, um, are celebrating, sorry, <laughs> the language is a little funny, um, but it was a community cancer center established um, 40 years ago, and they are currently celebrating 40 years of realizing its vision to serve the community by providing the highest level of quality care to patients dealing with cancer and blood disorders. A member of the Community Oncology Alliance, HOA has offices in Auburn, Camillus, East Syracuse, and Syracuse. HOA continues that vision with a multifaceted team dedicated to holistic, patient-centered care. The only cancer practice in CNY who is certified for quality by the American Society of Clinical Oncology. HOA serves as a certified oncology medical home, which means all care plans center around what is best for the patient. With an emphasis on quality care versus quantity, OMH patients generally experience lower costs, higher satisfaction, reduce medical errors, and are better informed. So once again, thank you so much for joining us. Um, Trisha, we are so grateful to have you with us tonight. And with a little bit of patience, I'm gonna ask you to take over the virtual stage. I need to mute some things and other stuff. So give me a few seconds and I'll give you a thumbs up when we're ready to go. Sound good? Okay. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for having me here tonight. Um, I see some familiar names in the screen, so that's kind of nice. Um, as um, Jess mentioned, I do work at HOA as the survivorship uh, coordinator, um, nurse practitioner. Um, so I thought tonight I would just kind of start out by giving a general um, overview of survivorship, kind of what it means um, if you were to come to a survivorship visit or um, just in general. Um, so I did have some slides uh, for us, but I think I'm just going to do it more as a as a talk. And then if we have questions, we can always do the chat at the bottom of the page or um, whatever you guys need to do. So I entitled the talk tonight as survivorship, the ins and outs. Um, let's see here. So um, when you think of a survivorship, you think of survivors, and um, there are a couple of definitions of um, survivor. Um, one is having no sign of cancer after finishing treatment. So you have surgery, maybe you have chemotherapy, maybe you have radiation, or just simply surgery. Um, and then you have no further cancer noted in your, in your body. So you're considered a survivor. The other definition um, that we follow is living with through and beyond cancer. Um, this definition kind of starts at the diagnosis of cancer, of your cancer, and just kind of continues on. Um, I have had people um, come into the office and they don't like the the idea of being a survivor. They don't like to be um, identified as a survivor. And I think it's very um, personal, you know, their reasoning. Um, some of the patients can't relate to being a survivor. Maybe their cancer wasn't so bad. You know, they had surgery um, and they're just monitoring now. And so they feel like, you know, what I went through wasn't something that I need to be labeled a survivor. Um, some people, think of the word survivor and it kind of scares them. You know, they're afraid to look into the future. Um, maybe when they look into the future, they don't feel that they're going to be there. So, you know, to call themselves a survivor might make them feel uncomfortable. Um, sometimes patients will tell me that being called a survivor makes them feel weak and, um, you know, or, or else they feel like they're taking something away from other people, like their cancer um, didn't require as much inter intervention. And so, you know, they're taking away from somebody that may have had more advanced stage cancer. But whatever the, the reason is, if they don't want to be identified as a survivor, then we certainly can't, can't force that onto them. But um, we do try to make them feel more comfortable about it and let them know that, you know, they are part of the future. Um, in the United States alone right now, there are 18.1 million survivors. Um, and that number is just increasing. The, the, the view coming forward is um, there's gonna be quite a few more. So what that means is that our primary care providers are gonna have a lot more on their plate. You know, they can't treat 
a survivor the same way that they treat a general population patient. It's just more complex. Um, so the aspects of survivorship, some of the things I'm gonna talk about tonight um, include follow-up care, um, which includes watching for recurrence. Um, that's gonna be one of the, the, the most important parts. Um, we know that when we treat you for your cancer, you know, we're confident that um, we're gonna be watching for this, but it's on the forefront of everybody's mind, you know, watching for this recurrence from happening. Um, we also look at late side effects. So treatments aren't benign for the most part. You know, there are side effects that can happen while you're having the treatment. And then there's side effects that we need to kind of keep an eye on down the road for years. And the primary care providers, you know, know about these side effects. They have to kind of keep them at the forefront. So for you as a cancer survivor, you should also be aware of what these side effects are and what to watch out for. So you can be proactive in your care and um, kind of bring it up if, if need be. Um, we talk about quality of life and psychological and emotional health. I personally feel that this is one of the most important aspects of survivorship. Um, when you have somebody that um, has been diagnosed with a life altering illness, whether it be cancer or something else, a little um, bit of psychological, emotional um, well being needs to be looked at every, every visit. Um, it's not just mechanical at this point. You know, we don't just listen to your heart and lungs and say, okay, everything's good. We need to give you some, some background and some, some empowerment to, to get through some of that. Um, in economical issues. This is something that patients don't really think about um, or people in general don't, they don't think about economical issues that can come up for survivorship. Um, but if you think about it, this is a, something that happens in your life that was unexpected. And even just, um, you know, coming to visits, more visits. So you have to take off more work and you have to drive to your visits. And um, sometimes the economical issues can really become problematic. And then finally, um, we look at cancer prevention. So not just a recurrence in the type of cancer that you've had, but we also need to look at how we can prevent further cancers from happening. Um, so we look at routine health maintenance and, and what people are, are doing to help with that. So first is the follow-up care or watching for recurrence. Um, so a lot of patients will come in to see me and I give them kind of a timeline as far as you know, what their doctor visit schedule might be. And it's a lot. Sometimes it's more than they were expecting. So, you know, every three to six months, that first two years, um, that's a lot of time taking off from work. It's a lot of time to commit to coming to a visit. Um, but when you come into these visits, it's not just a, hey, how are you doing? We're really checking to see, you know, are there any signs as slight as they could be that could be happening, that a recurrence could be, could be occurring? Um, when you come in, they'll do your clinical breast exam and, you know, teach you how to be confident in when you check your own breasts and things like that. Um, we also look at genetic testing uh, when we look for recurrence. When you have a patient that has uh, breast cancer, there are other syndromes that we look at or groupings of genetics that we look at that might give us a hint that, you know, we need to watch for your ovaries or we need to watch for your pancreas, things like that. Um, so we do offer genetic testing for all breast cancer patients um, here at the office, um, but not everybody needs to be tested. So if you have no family history of any other types of cancer, this is just something that came up for you. Maybe it's not a good time to check for genetic testing. Um, it's very personal decision. It might open up some other testing that you weren't kind of ready for. Um, and 10% of all cancers are genetically motivated. So it's not a huge number, but we are finding more and more um, genes that are affecting different cancers. So you might find that, oh, in you know, 2012, I had the BRCA1 and BRCA2 gene tested. Well, now we're testing 
60 to 80 other genes that can, can kind of be affected. Um, also, patients will ask me, well, why can't I just do um, 23andMe? And I, they don't look at all of the different mutations. That's the problem with the 23andMe. Um, they look at some of the more, um, more generic, if you will, um, readings. And then our testing that we do looks more specific. Um, so breast uh, self-exams, we need to make sure that we're doing those monthly. So patients will tell me things like, I didn't feel it in the first place. And I say, I totally get it. <laughs> um, but what happens is that when you check your breasts monthly, um, you're looking at what your normal is and you're going to be able to let your provider know that, hey, this is a little different over here. I'm feeling something that's odd to me. Or you check them out in the mirror and you see that your nipple isn't pointing the norm way it normally points. Maybe it's inverted or looking off to the right or something. Um, so in that case, you're giving us more of a clue to say, hey, you know what, this, we need to look closer at this. I call these exams get to know you breast exams um, because it's basically just letting us know when there's a change. Patients will often tell me that I don't have breasts anymore, so why do I need to check them? So when I have a patient that has had a bilateral mastectomy or a unilateral mastectomy, I still encourage them to check their mastectomy um, breast. Uh, you want to just make sure across that uh, incision site that there's no extra lumps kind of brewing in there. You also want to check your lymph nodes. Um, the, your risk of recurrence after having a bilateral mastectomy is certainly a lot lower, um, but in medicine, nothing is ever 100%. So we need to be diligent about checking our breasts and our chest walls and our lymph nodes. Um, and then follow-up screenings. So follow-up screenings detect other types of cancers. So um, your body doesn't realize that it's already had a cancer, that it's not your turn to have something else go on. So you want to make sure that, you know, you're getting your colonoscopy and the colonoscopies are now down to age 45. Um, and then, you know, based on whatever the, the readings show, you get your follow-up after that. So um, unless you have had um, bilateral mastectomy, you still get a, a mammogram once a year. You're still going to get your uh, colonoscopy every, at least every 10 years, maybe sooner if you've had a polyp or family history um, and different screenings like that, pap smears and things. So late side effects. So some of our treatments will um, cause some late side effects from a to for occurring. Um, so chemotherapy. So chemotherapies um, work really well for our cancers, but we have to watch things afterwards. So a lot of our breast uh, cancer patients will have adromycin or um, doxorubicin along with cytoxin and taxol. Some of these names may sound familiar to you guys. Um, so those are the ones that we kind of focus on when um, we talk about late side effects. So the first late side effect that a chemotherapy agent can cause is long-term cardiac symptoms. So um, some people have had Herceptin when you have a HER2 positive uh, breast cancer and you're getting your echocardiograms every three months while you're having your treatment. And then after you're done with your treatment, the, the echocardiograms, echocardiograms stop. That's because Herceptin doesn't cause long-term heart issues. It's only, um, we only worry about that while you're taking the medication. But the doxorubicin or the adromycin, that can cause long-term heart failure type symptoms. So you're gonna wanna watch for increased fatigue, chest pain, shortness of breath, um, and swelling to your lower extremities. And I always try to emphasize this for women because we have a tendency of saying, oh, I'm so fatigued, but it's because I was up late with the kids or I was running to this project with them and then had to work and then had to do laundry and whatever. So I like to make sure that everybody um, is aware that, yeah, watch for those things from happening. Um, neuropathy, so Taxol is our notorious neuropathy causer, if you will. Um, neuropathy can be, can resolve. And if it does resolve, great. Um, but if it doesn't resolve, then we have to kind of watch that. And you can get neuropathy in your hands or your feet. 
Um, certainly if you do anything with your hands and you have neuropathy, it can decrease, you know, your activities there. If you have neuropathy in your feet, it can um, increase your risk of falling. It can increase your risk of um, infection. So if you do have neuropathy, I usually um, let patients know to, you know, if you're walking on unsteady terrain, get a walking stick or a cane. Um, and if you are um, in the house, wear shoes in the house to kind of prevent um, injury from happening. And then check your feet um, when you go to bed, just to make sure that you didn't step on something and then not realize it. There are some medications that you can try to take for neuropathy and they are definitely getting better. There are side effects of the medications as well, but that's something that you can talk to your primary care or your oncologist about. Um, lung problems or shortness of breath. Um, some medications can decrease your, um, your um, pulmonary function. So um, if you do have shortness of breath or things like that, then you wanna let somebody know. Uh, fatigue, just in general, chemotherapy can um, make you tired. And some people never really get out of that, that pattern. You know, they are tired and so they sleep a lot. And what the research is showing us is that if you're more active, then you're more apt to recover from that fatigue. Um, chemo brain, chemo brain is a real thing and it can last for a long, long time. Um, unfortunately, most people have a reversal. The further away from your diagnosis, the decrease of stress, the decrease of all the appointments, the anxiety will help decrease that chemo brain. However, there are some times where people just never really get that sharpness back and um, they really have to write notes and keep track that way. And finally, secondary cancers. So uh, most times if you're going to get a secondary cancer, it's because you've taken chemotherapy for a long period of time. So we do watch for things like leukemias and lymphomas when you do take some of these medications, but uh, for the most part, uh, you should be okay because most breast cancer patients don't have to take the chemotherapy for a long time. It might feel like that at the time, but um, relatively speaking. Um, so radiation therapy also causes some late side effects. Um, skin changes to the area. Um, sometimes that skin will become very tight and um, you might notice that your unaffected breast is getting larger, but really what's happening is that it's just naturally kind of sagging and doing the, the, the normal things and your radiated side might be a little bit more tight. So it kind of stays where it, it was. Um, brachial plexopathy, which is a type of neuropathy that comes from your neck nerves into your shoulder, into your arm, and can cause some neuropathy from that. That's another side effect. Uh, lymphedema is where you have uh, unilateral or one-sided swelling uh, because of the lymph nodes being um, irritated or, or messed with, if you will. Um, we see that a lot if patients have had a mastectomy, a lot of lymph nodes removed and radiation. Um, so we do have a cancer rehab specialist, Janine, which a lot of people have seen and she's wonderful, um, but she will teach our patients to um, do certain stretches, do certain massage techniques. She'll fit for um, gloves and sleeves. Um, and just kind of keep track of things. Lymphedema is one of those things though that can happen at any time. So you wanna really watch for things. Um, I always tell patients, you know, especially with the COVID vaccine being notorious for messing with lymph nodes to get everything on your opposite side if you can um, to decrease your risk of developing um, lymphedema. Don't wear tight clothing, make sure you keep doing your stretches and that's gonna be helpful. Um, finally, change in your body. So um, sometimes when people have radiation, they'll be scarring um, and that can be devastating for a woman, especially if you know you, you really care about that stuff and that's you, you are welcome to do that. But um, it can really change the way that your chest wall appears or your breast appears. Uh, quality of life, psychological and emotional health. Again, this is the one I feel is, is the one that we need to focus on um, a lot. So some patients um, will have increased anxiety, depression, and stress after treatment has been completed. And when you think about anxiety, um, it can be anything such as 
you know, is this going to happen again? Um, is that twinge I feel part of cancer coming back? Um, is that pain in my rib part of cancer coming back? And it's hard to tease out, especially if you're the one living it. So I always tell patients, come in and be seen. Let us help you tease out um, what is a symptom that you're watching for um, and, and let us know where your anxiety lies. Um, in this uh, quality of life, psychological and emotional health, we don't really have a great way of screening for it, except for, you know, we, uh, PHQ-9, which is a, a form that you answer like nine questions. Um, but if you're not ready to talk about having anxiety and depression, you're not going to fill out that form the way it, it should be filled out. So it's something that we need as providers need to ask. And we need to um, hopefully ask you in a, in a welcoming way and not as a um, make you feel even more anxiety. Um, depression is another um, emotion that you might feel. People will say, why did I get breast cancer? Why did it happen to me? Um, there's no breast cancer in my family. I, I ate healthy. I didn't smoke. I did my mammograms. You know, why did it happen? And unfortunately, there's no answer. Um, but we can help you get through that. Um, we do have um, social workers here in the office and uh, HOA patients are welcome to utilize them at any time um, to talk about their feelings. Um, some people feel guilt. You know, why did I survive when my sister passed away? Why did I survive when I see people at treatment really struggling? Um, and that's a hard thing to kind of get through. Um, you're allowed to survive. You're allowed to be, um, be able to keep functioning. Um, I try to encourage people to just keep going. Um, sexual dysfunction. Sexual dysfunction is a very big um, issue with breast cancer patients. Um, there's all kinds of reasons why we have sexual dysfunction. Um, could be that you had a mastectomy and you no longer have the, um, the sexual organs that kind of get your body ready, you know, um, no nipples. And so you don't have the oxytocin release um, to kind of get things moving. Um, sometimes it's medication, you know, chemo, certain chemotherapies, certain medications can put you into menopause. Um, which causes vaginal dryness, which causes painful intercourse, which causes you not to want to do it. Um, and then your GYN might say, well, let's give you some estrogen. And then you're like, oh no, I can't have estrogen because I had an estrogen receptor positive breast cancer. So it's a big vicious cycle that we kind of go through. Um, tamoxifen, tamoxifen is notorious for decreasing your libido. Um, and I've spent so much time talking to my GYN friends um, about what I can do to help help with the decrease in libido and the, in the sexual dysfunction. One thing with um, tamoxifen, my GYN friends tell me to use, um, have patients use KY jelly, um, even if they're not having vaginal dryness, because it kind of tricks your brain into thinking, oh, was I ready for sex now? Okay. So then you know, you're kind of ready. So which came first, your brain or your, your body and getting ready for, to have intercourse. Um, as far as um, vaginal dryness goes, if you don't want to use um, the estrogen cream, um, there are vaginal moisturizers that you can utilize. Um, to, um, Replens is one that's over the counter. Um, and then I usually have patients, um, I have some samples in my office of different ones that you can get online. Um, hyaluronic acid, um, moisturizers with hyaluronic acid, that's one that you want to kind of watch for. They did a study between um, hyaluronic acid and estrogen. And so I usually encourage patients to use that. Some patients want to use coconut oil or something um, more natural. Um, and you can definitely use that as a um, lubricant. Um, when you're going to have intercourse, but um, using it every day, like as a vaginal moisturizer, um, it changes the pH in your vagina, which can increase irritation and other issues. So I don't encourage coconut oil um, for um, a moisturizer. Um, I did look up areas that had um, 
sexologist or um, a sex therapist, um, because it could be something as far as much as your partner doesn't want to hurt you. You know, they don't, they're afraid that, you know, if they try something that it's going to cause discomfort and then it's going to be uncomfortable for everyone. Um, sometimes it's the woman because they've never been the aggressor. And so your partner doesn't know that you're ready to, to try to have sex again after having all the treatment and all the fatigue and everything. Um, so having a conversation is really important. Um, and then also, um, maybe it's just so much that you guys have kind of gotten out of the habit of doing it. And so how do we get back into it? And maybe you need a date night. Maybe you need to find some pretty lingerie because you are afraid of what your chest looks like. Leave it on, you know, try to try to figure out ways to kind of get around it. But the areas that have the um, sex therapists is Ithaca, Rochester, and of course, New York City. We don't have anything around here. Um, another psychological, emotional quality of life issue might be weight gain. So we see weight gain from medications, including chemotherapy. Maybe you're on an aromatase inhibitor um, to decrease the amount of estrogen in your, in your body. So what happens if you don't have estrogen? It's very difficult to lose weight. So that might be an, an issue. Um, so we try to encourage 150 minutes of low to medium impact um, exercise weekly. And, you know, going to the YMCA is a great way to kind of get that, that time. Um, you can go and um, use the machines or do a class and you get your, get your minutes. And um, we also have dietitians on staff here at HOA that can help with uh, weight management or um, different things like that. The next part to talk about is economic issues. Um, so, if you think about um, the economic issues that can come from having cancer, um, starts with your insurance. Maybe you don't have insurance. Maybe you have inadequate insurance. Um, insurance is expensive, so maybe you chose the lowest, you know, insurance so that you can have more um, fluid money. Um, so maybe the co-pays are a lot more, your, your responsibility for the treatments end up being a lot more. Um, we do have patient advocates that can help, um, if that's the case here. So if you do need help with your insurance, just make sure you look around, um, out of pocket expenses. And that could be anything from like gas or childcare, um, I feel like the YMCA has like a childcare um, program though, that if you are going to treatment, um, they can help you out with childcare. So that's another great thing that the YMCA has to offer for our cancer patients. Um, if you're unable to work during, due to treatment um, or the side effects of treatment, if you don't have sick leave or if you're a part-timer and you get paid based on coming in to work, um, so that might decrease your, your, your um, income. I had a patient once that she loved overtime. She, I, I think she worked 60 hours a week and loved it. And after she was diagnosed with cancer and she's going through her treatment, she could maybe do 20 hours of regular work a week. So her paycheck really went down. And you don't even think about that as being an economic issue. At least I didn't it until she brought it up that, you know, I usually like to work a lot more and now I, I don't get to. Um, let's see here. What else? Um, some patients will um, not be able to work up to their potential um, meaning that, you know, maybe they're going to be forced to quit or fired because maybe they have chemo brain and they just can't kind of get things back together. I tell patients the story about my husband. Um, he had a really great secretary and I apologize because I can't remember her name. I think it was Margaret. Anyway, so um, Margaret ended up getting breast cancer and taking some leave um, to get her treatment and everything. And then when um, Margaret came back, she wasn't working um, to her uh, 100%. And so my husband came home from work. Um, this is when I first started working at HOA and I was telling him about how like, I'm learning all this stuff about how, you know, 
chemo brain is a real thing and it can affect your you know work and all this stuff. And he's like, he's like, yeah. He said, Margaret was out for breast with her breast cancer treatment. She came back and I don't know, she's just not herself. She's just not able to keep up. I, I don't know what I'm going to do. I, I'm like, talk to her about it. I'm like, oh, you absolutely will not. <laughs> and I made sure that he knew that, you know, he needed to give her time. She might be, she might look perfect on the outside, come into work and, you know, got her hair all done and whatever, whatever. But on the inside, she could still be, you know, kind of dealing with, with some cognitive dysfunction. She could be having some emotional stuff going on. You just don't know. So you need to give her a break. And so he was very happy that I told him that he needed to, you know, knock, knock it off. Um, so when we talked can about cancer prevention, um, we talk about seeing your primary care provider. Um, in this area, I find that most of my patients have a primary care provider that they are seeing on a regular basis. Some patients don't. Some patients use them as a, an as-needed, um, almost like an urgent care kind of thing. But when you have had cancer, you really need to get a relationship with your primary care so that they can, um, so that they can um, kind of keep everything in check. They're the, the cog to the wheel, if you will. Um, so they are going to make sure that you're getting your routine health maintenance and screenings, um, except for uh, maybe your mammogram. And if we are giving you a medication that can affect your bone density, then we might do the bone density. But for the most part, everything needs to kind of go back to your primary care so they can keep everything, keep everything going. Smoking cessation is another big one for cancer prevention. Um, Smoking can affect lung cancer, obviously, but it can also affect 13 other um, cancers um, that we need to kind of watch out for. Um, we do have a smoking cessation program here, um, but, you know, talking to pe people about smoking cessation is a big thing. Weight management. So we have found that um, obesity increases your risk of developing breast cancer, especially after menopause. Um, and we need to make sure that, you know, you don't go from having a normal weight to having, uh, to being overweight or to being obese, because that change also increases your risk of, of developing cancer. So you want to make sure you're kind of keeping a check on your, on your weight, um, and doing that through the Y, doing that through dietitians, doing that through, um, um, just being active, uh, nutritional support. Um, again, we have the, the dietitians, but you, you need to eat healthy foods that can help your bones. It can help your, your body just in general. Um, alcohol intake should be um, limited for women. Uh, one drink per day um, is as much as the NCCN uh, would like you to have. Um, estrogen receptor breast cancer, estrogen receptor positive breast cancer should avoid more than three servings of soy a day. Um, sugar in moderation. Um, more specific things can be brought up to a dietitian. I know Emily came in, spoke to the group uh, a few weeks ago, and um, she has a lot of uh, great information. Also supplements. So a lot of patients will come in and ask me, can I use this supplement? Can I use that supplement? And a lot of times I will defer them over to our, um, our dietitians um, because they have more of those answers than I do. Um, so there's so many aspects to survivorship and to take care of a survivor as a primary care can be, can be difficult. So some patients will do some, some self, um, explore exploration. They'll look up things, um, on the internet and they'll bring those to their healthcare provider, which I think is absolutely perfect. If you read something online and you have a question about it, um, come in and talk to a healthcare provider. Maybe they haven't seen that article and you can educate them. Um, you can talk about 
you know, where the information kind of came from. I, util I usually ask patients to utilize reliable websites such as um, .gov or .edu websites, um, but there are some reliable .com websites as well. Um, but you just wanna make sure that you are utilizing them appropriately. Um, you wanna ask those questions. So, you know, I read this somewhere and, you know, come in and ask that question. Joining a support group, um, in this area, we have a couple of different support groups for breast cancer uh, survivors, certainly the uh, Lori's Hope and um, Live Strong program through the YMCA, but also Krauss has a, a, um, a support group for, um, for breast cancer survivors. Um, later this year, uh, we plan on doing some additional support groups for young um, breast cancer survivors just to kind of help them out as well. Um, sometimes volunteering to help will kind of help you um, kind of get through this journey as well. So if you can volunteer, one of the most important things, though, is to participate in self-care. Um, coming to Lori's Hope, going to the YMCA, doing those types of things for yourself is very important. Um, you got to keep doing that, um, and, th and that's going to help. Um, that's all I have. If anyone has any questions... Thank you so much, Trisha. Yeah, thank you for having me. I'm just going to go ahead and spotlight myself. Um, thank you for that generous, informative, um, and also casual and at times a little bit funny um, entertainment, <laughs> um, entertainment education. Um, and so I just wanted to extend my gratitude on behalf of the YMCA of Central New York for your time and expertise. Um, and so if anyone has questions um, that is joining us with on Zoom, please go ahead and put those in the chat and I will read those out loud, um, both for Tricia and for the folks that are here with us in the room and also anybody that may be joining us at home. Um, if you are on Zoom, you can also raise your hand. Um, there's a little raise your hand function at the bottom. There's a smiling face with a plus, and then I can call on you. So go ahead and do that if you would like. Um, and then if there is anybody in the room that has questions, just maybe like raise your hand and then we can um, sort of like move through it through that way. All right, so it does look like that we have a question coming in from Tracy who um, asks, why are there no regular imaging for surveillance? And just give me a moment here to mute you. So why are there no regular imaging for surveillance? For patients that have had um, bilateral mastectomy, I'm assuming um, that's what the question is. Um, doing a mammogram wouldn't be ideal, um, because you don't have the tissue to do the mammogram. Um, regular MRIs aren't recommended, um, at this point. If you have family history, if you have had, um, a complex case, your surgeon may do regular MRIs, um, they're now doing MRIs more often as well for um, dense breasts. We used to just do a mammogram and an ultrasound. And lately I've noticed that the radiologists are asking for MRIs. Um, certain types of um, reconstruction might require or recommend an MRI. Um, to watch for those implants. Um, but for the most part, uh, we feel that if you have had a bilateral mastectomy and you have not had reconstruction, doing your breast exams um, will give us the information that we need. Thanks so much, Trisha. Do we have any further, do we have any questions from anybody in the room? Any comments? So Tracy wants to know about recurrence. Um, how does- we've got, So in the room, we've got some gratitude, um, thanking you for the presentation, very informative um, and general gratitude. I see that we um, also have another question from Tracy um, who asks, how does recurrence usually present itself? Are we just looking for lumps? 
So that's one of the main things for sure. You also want to look for skin integrity changes. So um, redness, or if your skin starts looking like the texture of an orange peel, those are types of things that you want to watch out for. If you are, um, when you check your, um, your armpit, you want to watch for lumps in the armpit because that's where your lymph nodes live that kind of are attached to the breast area. Um, if you have a, um, an implant in, I usually tell patients to kind of look in the mirror, make sure that your implants aren't kind of twisting or changing um, and that things are kind of looking the way they should. I have patients, you know, lift their arms up, look for dimpling, um, but also just underneath the implant, try to get under there and um, try to feel around a little bit. But those are very, very good questions. Thanks so much, Trisha. And thanks for those great questions, Tracy. Um, I also, you know, I, I have a question that I'd like to ask. Um, you know, you, offer, you offered a lot of information around how um, individuals that have experienced breast cancer can um, seek support. How do you, um, I also know because I have breast cancer in my family, so it's um, quite personal in that way. Um, what do you recommend in terms of communicating with your patients around um, helping the people in their life that may be providing care for them, educate themselves or, um, you know, uh, seek resources, for example, perhaps they need mental health counseling. So how might you suggest, for example, someone who is a survivor um, or is having a severe, the experience of a survivor in terms of doing some of that challenging communication with family members, friends, or people that may be providing you support, but may also be adding to your anxiety um, or stress levels? Yeah, so that's a really good um, question because it's a very thin line between helping and hindering. So, you know, you can say to your uh, family member, I see you struggling. Can we do something together? Is there something that I can do to help you? Um, a lot of times patients will say, oh, I'm, I'm here for you. Okay, bye, you know, and then you don't hear back from them. Um, really just show up at their house and be like, what do you need done? What, what can I put in the laundry or, or whatever? Um, if they are um, struggling to the point where you feel they need to have um, mental health um, help, uh, they are the ones that have to call, that have to like make that, that first move, unfortunately. Even primary care providers can't call a psychologist and say, hey, I'd like to get my patient in to see you. It has to be from the patient, um, unfortunately. But um, if they are a patient of HOA, very simply, they call the main number. They say, I need to talk to somebody about my feelings and we get you set up with a social worker. Um, but there are other resources in the community um, that you can uh, look at, you know, psychological healthcare in the area and things like that. Did I answer your question? Um, sort of. I, I guess my question was a little bit more in terms of supporting um, patients around having healthy boundaries with people in their life who may be causing them stress. So, uh, I guess so. Um, you know, it's yeah. just something that I saw with a lot of people was that it was like, you know, you are going through a very stressful time of your life and some people may be offering help, but not in a way that's actually helpful. Right. So what would you suggest for people that are maybe navigating some of those difficult human relationships where maybe people that are in your life or are trying to help are actually maybe making things worse. Does that make sense? Yes, that makes more sense. Yes. So um, putting up boundaries is, a, is hard, especially if you are asking for help or you need help. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of negative things. You know, people only want to share the negative stories for things and it just can, it can cause more, more fright and more uh, chaos. Um, but, you know, saying that, you know, thank you for your concern, but I'm going to talk to my primary care about it, or um, maybe now's not the time for you to talk to me about that. You know, that might be direct and, you know, maybe the other person gets a little will hurt, but you got to protect yourself. 
you, you know, you're going through this journey, you're, you know, you're the one that's going to radiation, you're the one that's going to chemotherapy, you're the one that has to take that cancer pill, you're the one that has to pay these bills. So you need to take care of yourself and you need to just be able to say, thank you, but I got it. Thank you so much for that. Um, is there any other questions here in the room or on Zoom? Yes, Sue. So my question is um, kind of based off on what Jess just asked. So how do you help your family members understand what you are going through? Mm. Um, because I have a cousin recently that diagnosed and like her family member is like her husband and her son, they don't know how to act around them because it's such a sensitive subject. So how do you relate to your actual family members to help them understand what you're going through? Did you get that enough? I think so. I okay. Think All right. Give me one second. Just I think the question was, how do you help? How do you help family members kind of cope with what you're going through if they don't understand? Um, men have a very hard time with this because um, if anyone ever read the book, uh, women are from Venus, men are from Mars or whatever that book was, men want to help us. They want to fix us. They want to make us better. That's their job. They're the man of the house. So. Um, if they see you struggle and they can't fix you, they struggle more. And instead of just being there beside you while you cry, holding your hand, they want to smother you and make you better. That's not helpful. And so I would suggest that maybe they participate in a support group or they um, come to a counseling session, you know, if you're seeing the social worker. Um, certainly if they, if you have a survivorship visit with me, I try to incorporate whoever's in the room and, you know, ask them, how, how do you feel about all this going on? Um, but you got to do it in a way that we're not taking away from the patient, the, the person that's having the, the issues. Um, so I wish there were more resources. Um, I know I had a patient that had a teenage son that was really struggling um, to understand the whole cancer diagnosis and, you know, what they can do. And I was looking all over for resources for this kid. And there literally was, I mean, there, was, there were things for little kids to understand cancer. Um, and then there were things for adults, but like that middle school kind of high school time, and um, the patient's son was very close to her and um, he was struggling. He was having a hard time. Um, school counselors might be an option um, or getting them into a counseling uh, for themselves, which I know right now is kind of difficult, but you know, if you make that first step, sometimes you can get in, you know, hopefully when you need to. Thank you. There we go, there goes the echo. <laughs> I was doing so well with the technology. Um, so I, you know, did, did that answer your question? Yeah. Do you have a follow-up to it or is that, you're good, okay. Any additional questions or comments from any of our friends here with us tonight at the K-Center? Yes. I just wanna say just, I was just thinking about that. Early in my cancer journey, I sort of wish that there was a family, mm -hmm. right? So where families could come together and children could see other children experiencing mm -hmm. that cancer diagnosis because it's very difficult for a parent to explain things when you're mm. having a difficult time yourself. <laughs> you know, it's exhausting, you know, and I don't mean to be a bad parent in that moment, but it's like you wish that some of that could be taken off of you and that burden placed on just a child. And, and, to have the child feel like, okay, I'm not alone in this. Like the other kids whose mom had cancer. It just, gosh, we need to start something like that here for families, I think. Because the isolation is is really difficult, I think, for kids, particularly teens, right? Because mm. teens are already isolated developmentally, I think. So, yeah. 
COVID got on our list. <laughs> COVID made it when I had a fever fit and they took me out and they ate me. Because they retreat already, right? Yeah. So, yeah. So for our, thank you for sharing, um, for the, those of you that shared. Um, for our friends online, um, we had a few friends here that shared um, a desire for more family supports um, and that the challenging of particularly things like isolation among young children, but also teenagers who already experience that to them have that experience compounded by having a family member with cancer. Um, and then on top of that, also to a desire for more supports to help alleviate some of the burden um, of supporting children who really need to connect with other children who are going through a similar experience. Um, so yes, I will pass it over to you. If you have resources or suggestions, that would be great. But I also hear that there's maybe a desire you know, to continue that conversation in this room. Mm -hmm. So unfortunately, I don't know of anything right now, but I think the YMCA is a great place to kind of start that. <laughs> um, I know they have prime time and they have all kinds of resources for kids and um, mental health in the United States is just terrible, you know, and these kids already feel isolated because most of them have had to homeschool for a while or, you know, do the Zoom stuff for school. And even before that, it was cell phones and it was video games. And um, so to open up that area, that sounds like a fabulous idea. And I think that's kind of setting our kids up to succeed um, mentally and emotionally and let them know they're not alone and it takes a village to kind of get through things. Um, so, geez, I think that's a great idea. <laughs> Yeah, I'll echo that. And, you know, for the folks that may be listening that have youth, um, we do definitely have some teen programmings. None of them are survivor family kind of oriented, but we do have Leaders Club, which is a really incredible program for specifically teens. We also have youth writing programs, um, most of which are meeting virtually right now. Um, but we have a variety of those through our downtown writer center as well, which is a really beautiful way for kids of all identities um, to connect with one another. So we definitely have some programs for that age bracket that may be an opportunity for kids to connect with other kids and also a safe space to express themselves um, creatively or socially or through developing leadership skills. Um, so those are a couple resources that we do have, but I do love the idea. And as a program person, I'm like, that's a really beautiful idea um, and something that, you know, hopefully we can talk more about as well. So any further questions or comments? Oh, wait, I see that we have um, Linda popped in. Linda, if you would like to unmute yourself, I see that you have. Um, we would love to have you share. So give me one moment here. Thanks. Um, I love what you said about the fact that families, you know, uh, children coming together. Uh, my son had cancer and he was a teen. And you're right, teens, it's really hard to find support but that was really important to him that he connected with other teens that were going through it. And so through the Children's Cancer Center, they created something at the Y um, and it affiliated um, with the hospital, but at the case center uh, called the HOPE program. And, and it was for families to come together and they would do like paint nights and they had like dogs come in from the SPCA and, and it was really, really helpful for my son. Um, so I would love to see the same for um, kids whose parents have cancer. That would be great. And they only do it like once a quarter. So it's not like a huge commitment, but yeah. Thank you so much for sharing that, Linda. Um, it was, I really appreciate it. I see some heads nodding in the room as well. Um, all right, Trisha, I'm gonna pass it back over to you. Um, so Linda, I'm glad that your son had that experience for sure, because I think it was super helpful. Um, right now in the Syracuse area, there is a program for um, teens and young adults that have cancer called um, 1330, and it's in Liverpool, and it's uh, free, um, and they have all kinds of like paint night and exercise night and 
movie night and all kinds of stuff. And it's like, it's all like bright colors and it's not, you know, oh, woe well, is me, you know, things like that. So um, that's really great. And so playing off of that, that whole like family dynamic, um, survivorship, hey, it's okay, you know, that you have these feelings. Um, sadness is, is okay to have as long as we can, you know, control it and move forward and things like that. And we gotta let kids know that it's okay. It's okay to feel scared. It's okay to feel um, mad that mom has this and can't take me to all my baseball games now or, or whatever. And so um, I really think that's a great program to think about. Thanks so much, Trisha. And thank you so much to everybody um, in Zoom, in the room for being present tonight, for sharing resources, for asking really thought-provoking questions and for really holding space together. Um, it, I think is a bit of an experiment for us to try to do this in a hybrid way. Um, so I wanna just thank everybody for allowing that to happen, but it is a direction that we're moving here in the Y to allow people to be able to join us from wherever they are um, you know, at the same time. So I just want to thank you all for doing that. And we will be attempting to do more of those things in the future um, so that we can spend more time together um, in meaningful ways, both in person and virtual and sort of like a hybrid experience like this one. Um, so with that gratitude, I would love to ask you, Trisha, if you have any final closing thoughts that you would like to leave us with this evening. So one of the things I tell patients when they come see me is that um, you need to give yourself uh, permission to not be the strongest mom in the room, to not be the strongest person, um, to, tell to tell your family, I need a minute. Um, you're going to look perfect on the outside, but you may be having a, a battle on the inside. And again, the emotional and the, the psychological stuff, I think is just so important because once you, once you kind of get that under control, I think that other things kind of fall into place, but you're allowed to have bad days. You're allowed to say, it's just not a good one today. And then pick yourself up tomorrow and start fresh. It's okay to ask for help. If a patient, if a family member comes over, it's okay to say, hey, can you go switch my laundry? You know, it's okay to do that a hundred percent. And if I was that family member coming to your house, I would be like, yes, I can change your laundry and I can do whatever you need. Um, because we, we as family members want to be that helpful person, but we also want to give you your space. And so to have an invitation to come in and do all these things is um, what we're looking forward to, but it's okay to have a bad day, but it's really okay to give yourself a, a day of self-care and it's okay to come to the YMCA even though you have to do the dishes and you have to switch that laundry and vacuum or whatever you know pay the bills whatever you it's okay to take that time those dishes will be there when you get back so just take the time for your self-care and um and then everything will be okay Thank you, Trisha, for that really beautiful invitation of both grace for oneself um, and also an invitation to prioritize your own self-care as you go through this journey. Um, I think that that is really beautiful wisdom um, for, you know, not only folks going through this particular journey, you know, but whatever um, other journey they may also be um, going through in life. So um, thank you once again for your expertise um, and your generosity this evening. And thank you so much to everybody who has joined us tonight. Um, it has been a really informative and beautiful beautiful evening of um, sharing and being together. And we are so grateful um, to be able to facilitate that. So um, thank you so much. And I want to wish everybody a really beautiful night. Mm -hmm.